My name is James Haywood, and I'm a co-founder of OptiClass with Chris. Uh, as you can see, I've shared the screen. Uh, a little bit about me and my background. I have uh, a master's degree in linguistics, and I've taught English as a second language uh, for a number of years in a number of countries. Uh, one of the problems I found as an online teacher was that I couldn't get hold of good uh, content to use in the digital environment. So I was able to find great content for screen sharing um, and to use on my laptop when I was doing in person. I found that a lot of the content was just appropriated from books and published materials and I became very tired of showing something that looked a bit substandard or looked, looked great on paper and not on screen. So that's where we originally developed off to class. I now uh, can uh, create the lesson so hopefully I'm in a good position to give you some ideas uh, about doing this. Uh, currently uh, a couple of years into our pro project we ha now have uh, over 500 lessons. Obviously lesson content creation is time consuming but I will say to you that it's extremely valid if you start and just go at it. So you know the best way to, to commence is just to begin um, and it is a bit of a hard slog but it certainly comes back to you uh, over time the amount of effort that you put in and obviously if you can make any of these things systemized systematic then it will become uh, faster as you go along and become more experienced at it so really what I want to do today is not reinvent the wheel I want to show you how I create content the fastest way that I can and in a way that works for students but also we share our content through this site or make it available for other teachers online so when I'm creating any lesson I always make sure that this is available for other teachers um, I know I'm not going to look at the question and answers as they're coming in Chris will um, Chris will deal with any of those that you have uh, I will try to make this short uh, about 20 to 25 minutes max because too much information will be overkill so I'll get started when I create a uh, any document the first thing that I do is actually put everything into word now I use word simply because it's the word processor document that I use but that's what I do and I'm very quickly going to share um, the genesis of the document is simply going to be something as simple as this so the reason I do it in word before I transfer it to another form is that when I'm working logically through a lesson in my head and I know that these are going to be transferred to a visual element I prefer to work through logically in what I call slides you can see here for example that I put slide one at the very top after slide one is what I will ask to the student so immediately comes the title or the instruction anything that I put in brackets is not to go on the slide but is an instruction about what will be placed on the slide often a visual element or something for me to add into teacher notes I'll explain those later and then simply text and exercises that eventually will be copy and pasted into the PowerPoint so I'm going to come back now and I will come back to <clears throat> what I do all of our lessons are built in PowerPoint I choose that obviously there are um, a lot of other uh, presentation um, formats available now Prezi there are a whole host of things I think I read an article recently of 31 different presentations that are alternatives to PowerPoint I use PowerPoint simply because I'm just too old to change and I really enjoy what PowerPoint has to offer. If it's used correctly, it's an extremely strong tool, and I am very well aware that Prezi does things in perhaps a more beautiful fashion, but for the amount of time that the average teacher or even language institute has to spend on content creation, I've stuck with something that I know. Hopefully in the future, I'll be in a position to change that, but PowerPoint, everything I show you today has been created in a PowerPoint document. When you write the word, when you've decided what you're going to write, just two things that I would insist go on every word document. One is you write a very short objective of the lesson. It doesn't need to be CELTA based or TESOL based. 
it's for your reference and sometimes when you are doing lesson content you are interrupted uh, as a teacher you have to go and teach or do something else it's really important to have something to come back to so just write a very brief lesson objective that is for you the next the only other thing that I put all the time onto my lesson uh, lesson content at the very top is a list of the vocabulary or the target language that I want to use in the lesson. It's very easy as you go down from slide one to slide number 17 to lose a little bit of track because you get in such a flow and sometimes I have arrived at the end of the lesson and I've gone too far, I've strayed too far from the target language or the target language is now something completely different to what I had originally wanted to do. So it, those two things keep me in line. A list of vocabulary and target language and a very short objective. As I said, it's just written in plain English. It's, it's up to you how complex or how TESOL, CELTA-based you want to make it um, at, the, at the beginning of the lesson. So into one of the lessons, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just um, PowerPoint display, uh, I'll just show you what our lessons look like. So we've loaded them up into Off to Class. These are actually created first in Word and second in PowerPoint, and then they are converted into our uh, format that goes onto our website. You can see here that everything I do is fairly bright, quite colorful, and in most of our slides you will see images. I'll come back and explain all of those. I just want to show you that on the right hand side is what a student would be looking at and on the left hand side you can actually see teacher notes. Now teacher notes are not compulsory obviously for lesson content but they are a great way if you are going to be sharing your um, documents with other teachers it's a great way to show other teachers how to use it and I actually create two um, PowerPoint documents at the same time. Well, I create the lesson first and then I go through and look, try to put myself in the shoes of another teacher. Everything another teacher, a colleague would need to teach that lesson in an effective way without having to go through and look at the entire lesson. I build my lessons with the idea that people will trust what I have written. It takes time but that's what the lesson, the teacher notes are there for. In our system, you can actually get rid, well not get rid of, you can close uh, the, just let me do that, you can close the, uh, you can see the teacher notes have popped out. For the purposes of this presentation, I will close them, you don't need to see them, but what I want to show you now is very bright, clear, and um, sparsely populated, uh, PowerPoint display. Um, this is actually teaches the verb, I think it's called the uh, pronoun movement or, or the s s um, separable transitive uh, phrasal verb rule. Uh, it's fairly complex rule but I've started with a very simple way so lots of images there. Okay, um, template is vital in PowerPoint when you start. So before you start your first lesson it is really important that you set up a template and the color scheme that you are going to use. Consistency is what students love, and they, so do not think you need to change every time you create a lesson, a new color scheme, different ways to present the language. Students love consistency, and it makes you look professional. Of course, not every slide can look the same, but there are a few elements that I'm going to talk about now that should be exactly the same in every lesson and almost every slide you undertake. The first one is the title. The title is, it's really important that you have a title at the beginning of, uh, sorry, you can see the title here. At the very beginning, there is at the top, I have a text box. It is always in the same place. It's ex in exactly the same position, left to right, and from the, the vert in the vertical, it does not change. And the reason that that is important is when you share a PowerPoint online, remember that the slides will generally be moving left to right or, or forward, unless you, of course, go in reverse. What you don't want is for the the instruction to be jumping around the screen. As I move through these slides, you can see that 
things are not moving up and down. They are moving and your eyes are staying and you can see the instruction, the information is passing at the same level for you as much as possible. And that is actually something that most people who create PowerPoint forget. They look at one slide and then they create the second slide independently of what has gone on the slide before from a visual element. Obviously, the text or the function of the slide will change, but keep in mind that that template, and you can see here, this particular slide, again, it's about phrasal verbs and it's an exercise. I have an instruction at the top. The instruction's a little bit long, so I have a little further information in another colored slide. And then you can see everything is quite clearly spaced and images are on as many of the slides as possible. <clears throat> okay, one thing I've, I failed to mention at the beginning, there are two more simple things that you might want to think about. First of all, are you collaborating with the lesson content? Is the lesson content that you were making for yourself, which is fine, or are you going to share this with colleagues? If you're going to share it, there are two other things I suggest you note. One is you put down what the topic is in the shortest, so beyond the lesson objective, which can be a, a couple of lines, what is the actual topic of the lesson? Is it speaking? Is it speaking about past tense? Is it you know phrasal verbs? Is it inseparable phrasal verbs? Just make the shortest possible topic for what that lesson is. And the second thing is, at which level is it destined? So either you can use the CEFR, the A1, A2, up to C2 level, or you might be using the American high school system, um, the Australian, wh whichever system you are using, you want to see how that lesson fits in at that level. The reason I say you mark those two things, the topic and the level, is simply that you may wish in the future to archive or even tag these lessons if you put them in some kind of system in which you can do that. And so searchability is greater. All of these things will, hopefully you'll end up with a library of 100 lessons and all of this information will be there for you ready to go as and when you can add this into your system. But if you have to do it in a retrofit, it becomes far more complicated and, and frustrating. So back to the, um, I'm going to move to another slide that I've created. Here you have a grammar explanation. And I'm just going to show you, uh, explain a little bit about, again, PowerPoint. It's really important to use the same font sizes. Again, I'm probably a little old fashioned, but I'm going to tell you that the font Arial works best in every single environment. It's up to you. Some people feel that the same font is boring to use over and over again, but if you are not using copious amounts of text, Arial is a winner. It is simply clear. It scores extremely high on readability. If you have dyslexic students, you are going to have to find a different font, but they are now available, and I, I don't know the particular names, but you would need something else. But Arial works extremely well for short titles and instructions, and even for longer pieces of text. The other reason that I choose Arial is that if you are, again, collaborating with other people in the project, when you are working between Macs and PCs and changing files from a PowerPoint to a PDF, things are going to happen that may be on your technical control. And if they are not true type fonts, you are going to find that they will change and it's not what you originally started with. Arial has caused me no grief. I can't say the same about other fonts, so I simply stick with it. In terms of font size, at the very top of the screen, where you will see um, the uh, where you will see our titles, the drawing tools, by the way, are in our uh, site off to class. If I were teaching a student, I'd be using them. So the font sizes that I use here, the top one is always 38. Okay, I try never to go beyond uh, underneath that or smaller than that, but 38 is a nice size point. Here. Everything underneath, I will use probably 26. And then the smallest that I will use, I'm going to show you, is in reading activities where I may drop down. And here you'll see a reading activity. 
A reading activity, the smallest font that I use for on-screen purposes, it drops down to 18. But that's the smallest font that I will ever use and that I advise you to use if your students are ever going to use your materials in an online, sorry, un, uh, using a phone or an iPad, I've found that the complaints come in from the students, anything lower than that. So that's what I would stick with there. Okay, so I'm just gonna come back to that. I've told you about the fonts and the positioning of the text on the slides. I've told you about using Arial. The next thing that you want to think about is color. Color is vital. It brings things alive. Unfortunately, I have little artistic talent, so I'm going to take you to two websites. PowerPoint obviously has a large number of useful colors that are already in the system, and I have used those for the majority of our lessons. However, there is no reason for those of you who are a little more adventurous to go into this great site that I'm going into now, it's called color.adobe.com. You can go into it in your, in your own leisure. And people with a much better aesthetic than myself have gone in and created these beautiful color schemes that you can then pull out and use into your in PowerPoint. Now, these are not PowerPoint colors. They are using the Pantone colors lessons that I would advise you to pick one for a template and stick with it. Before I show you how to use those colors in PowerPoint, what I want to tell you is that remember before you pick something that some of these will be highlight colors and some of them may be boxes in which you need text to stick out. So as much as I love this vitamin C, it's going to be difficult for a student to have text inserted in black or white on most of these colors. Perhaps the dark blue will work. So you need to choose one of the colors needs to be what I would call, I don't really know the color terminology, but for example, in color theme, I would almost say like a pastel. This gray will work as a background color with text in it and the upper colors, the darker colors, will work with small amounts of text, but some, this bright pink, for example, you could not have as the back um, of the slide. It would just be too much in one go. Once you've chosen the colors, the colors, if you hover over them, hopefully you can see a Pantene color number has come up. You actually need to go into a different color and put it into uh, the color hex converter. This is another slide, color.hex.com. And don't worry, we'll email this information and this um, presentation will be available to you. But I highly recommend all you need to do is go in and insert the information up here that you get, and it will convert it then. I should actually show this. So let me see. We want this color. So 741A. Three four, okay. So seven four one a three four, and if we get the information, just bear with me. Click on that, and it will bring up those numbers. And what you need to look for is R G B, and I'm going to show you very quickly how you do that. So I need to write those numbers down: one one six twenty six fifty two. I'm going to bring you back into a PowerPoint. Okay, so this is a PowerPoint that I'm working on at the moment. And I'm going to decide to use a different color. So I go into color into PowerPoint. I click on more colors. I go into custom. And I insert those numbers in here. And if I've done this correctly, hopefully 26. And then the last one was 52. There we go. The color has come up that I wanted. I'm going to OK that. It's changed the text. But what's important is that color now sits in your most recent colors on the bottom left here of that little drop down box. And you can now use this if I wanted to. I could highlight the box and I could go in and actually fill the entire shape 
in that new ox blood or burgundy color. So templates are vital. It takes a half an hour the first time that you decide to change the color, but really important to use. You can see here, if you were looking on the slide, that I have actually used a color scheme from that, and I think it's really effective. We're using this for our new functional lesson series. They're lovely, they're bright, they're colorful. Everything's quite easy to read. You've got a nice highlight in the blue and the red, and then I've got a background color which really brings it alive. Again, lots of images. So I'll come back. That's all about color. <clears throat> I'm going to come back now out of the Adobe website. And what you want to think about next is once you set up your template, there are different types of slides that you are going to show again and again and again. Most lessons, most of you are going to fo um, focus the uh, introduction, presentation, and then production style method that's used by most teachers these days. Um, so what you'll probably start with is perhaps a warm-up. Image works really well for that. And just very quickly, I will show you also images, as I've mentioned, are vital. There are many sites now today where you can, when, sorry, you don't need to purchase. The important thing is you want to use royalty-free sites um, and images that you have every right to modify and adapt online, and pixabay.com is a great one. Not everything is there, but when you're looking at nouns, and uh, actually, well, m mostly for nouns, um, it's a little weak when you need to display things like verbs, but that's, that's, that's normal. It doesn't have the greatest search functionality, but there are literally hundreds of thousands of images on here, and uh, you will probably find a great image to use here for any of your slides. All, right? so, um, all of these, for example, have probably come from Pixabay, and we're not infringing on anyone's copyright, which is important in this day and age. So that's... Um, the images. So next, I've spoken to you about color, is I want to go about the slide types that we use. So first of all, here, we've actually got a grammar presentation. In the grammar presentations, as you can see, I try to keep it extremely simple. It depends on what it is. It's not always possible to do that. But here, nice bright lines, and what the, there should be information in the teacher's slides, that provide the information that doesn't distract the student. You want the student to be focused on the minimal possible information to understand the concept of which you are speaking. And in the teacher slide, you want those questions for yourself or the other student. You don't want the student to be seeing all of that information. So grammar should be as clean and neat as possible. Obviously, it's not always possible to, um, you might need example sentences or even some images on there but genuine sorry um generally i advise you to keep it as clean as possible here is we go beyond the grammar and once i've shown for example this is a lesson uh clearly on adverbs of time um it's giving you the language the target language that the student is looking at now there's a lot of information on this slide However, I've broken it up by using these colors. You may have already noticed that in my grammar-based lessons, I tend to go for a monochrome. So I'll use one color, varying shades. I try not to use different colors. For some reason, I find that a monochromatic format works best in a grammar-based lesson. And I use that in various ways. Again, the instruction is always a slightly uh, less shaded text box, then I have an, uh, another explanation, um, and hopefully we'll move on to the instructions. So you, you've got a lot of information on this slide, but broken up by the boxes. Next, we'll go into a different type of slide, which is actually a presentation of the language in context. So here, I've got an explanation. Up the top is not an instruction. This is a lesson on phrasal verbs. It's a more advanced lesson. The student will already have gone through the explicit and hopefully the implicit grammar. So they know the difference between a separable and an inseparable transitive phrasal verb. But what you've got here is a presentation of the language. And then underneath, you've got the image of the coffee and then the language in context. 
And hopefully then, as a teacher, you can use that information to maybe get them to use the, the, the sentence in another way. Can they put the sentence in a negative tense? What you want is the smallest amount of information that then enables the teacher to use that in an adaptive way. Do not think when you create content that you need to put all information on the slide. In fact, the trick is to have the minimal amount because the better teacher you are, the, less, the more information is going to be off the slide. And for other teachers, especially inexperienced or new teachers, if you're writing content for them, you want all of that information off from what the student's focused on. So the student doesn't see that the teacher is simply reading in front of them. It's one of the big problems of textbooks is that inexperienced or lesser experienced teachers will simply be reading what the student can already see in front of them. And that starts to make the student feel what 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 am I what are you here for when I, I'm just following this with you? So what you want is information presented that then is added to in an adaptive way by the teacher. And I haven't always got this right. This has taken a lot of time for me to learn, but I know that it's one thing after creating 500 lessons that people are quite happy about with, um, with the lesson content that I create. Okay, we've got here, uh, again, you're going to go into after a, a lesson of, sorry, after a slide that shows gra uh, language in context, you'll probably go, hopefully, here we go, a gap fill activity. So fairly simple, standard, gap fills are great, although this one is using, again, um, okay, we've got some adverbs. Uh, okay, this is actually a listening, there's a listening exercise with this. You can see the audio controls up the top. I won't uh, talk to you with the, the audio at the moment, but again, just listen to Benjamin. The student knows Benjamin's going to talk. The instruction underneath, super simple. By the way, where I can, I never use the words try to do something or can you do something. Use imperatives. It makes the tech, you can reduce the text down and why ask a question when you can give an order to the student. So in order to reduce it, forget about your modal verbs, get rid of can or you might be able to or should you or could you or would you, just give an imperative, keeps the, keeps the text as short and sweet as possible. So here's a gap fill. Um, obviously with ours you can use the writing tools uh, to, to, to be able to um, you know, uh, guide guide the student uh, through through the text, um, but it's still. If you have a touch screen, you can draw whatever you do. These work very well when you're sharing the screen. So gap fills. Uh, I think not everybody likes a gap fill, but they're very good for experienced teachers. You can get the students to start using the words in different ways to put verbs. Uh, as I said, to maybe change the sentence about them to see if different words could go into different positions in the sentence to use different aspect and tense. Uh, so gap fills can be very good as a starting point. Um, here you've got a matching activity. These work quite well on off to class because the instruction is almost not required. So you can ask the student uh, to look at the language on the left. You can see one thing I realized I forgot to tell you is whenever you can label your images and your text boxes, I, sorry, either number them or label them A through to G, F, whatever you need. It gives a great point of reference for when you, the student needs to explain something. If they are an elementary or a beginner and they can't explain the language or uh, paraphrase it, they can just simply tell you picture one, um, text box A, the letter or the number will get you back on track very quickly. And that's something that is vital actually, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it earlier. Images, text boxes, label, number, super important. Here's a matching activity. They work particularly well because you can push a little bit of extra language onto the student. They're really scanning for information or reading for gist very quickly, looking for specific information. And then on the right hand side, you can see that I've, I've got a definition or a term um, and they've matched the definition to it. So you can do things a number of ways. I use these a lot in the phrasal verb, the conditional series. Matching works quite well because once you've matched, 
you can ask the student to also reinterpret the uh, information or give their own example. So that's another type of slide that I use quite heavily and that I think works well as an educational tool. Okay, the last one I want to show you is to come to a reading activity. So here I said the font, you can go down to 18, don't make it any less. On the left hand side, you've got a very small glossary. So I put in here one, two, I think we have a maximum of four words that may appear on the screen and also an image where possible that supports the text. So here I've gone back one slide, nice bright pre-reading pre activity. Um, they can already see who's going to be talking or the characters that will appear in this text and they have to obviously uh, predict what the text is going to be about or what is going to occur in the text. When you have the text online, for reading activities, I tend to put a number in. Again, you don't need to label or number images here, but what you want to do is for the student or yourself to be able to go, what word, which, where is the gerund in line five of the text? So you don't need every line numbered, but in the gap of five, it works particularly well. Those kinds of things, the numbers, the lettering, and the, the reference here for the reading, um, tend to simulate you know, how textbooks work and are very important for keeping the flow of the lesson and for the student to feel comfortable that they can come back if they don't explain, understand something and explain where they are. Okay, so that essentially is everything that I wanted to show. As I said, it's not rocket science, but the template, the colors, the images and the reduction of language to just the essential while you keep the teacher notes on another, um, here you can see the teacher notes, I've shown, shown you them on the left hand side, um, keep the teacher notes off the page. It really gives the student the idea that you're an experienced, you're a good teacher and you know how to lead and move this lesson forward without ever just repeating what's on the slide. The thing about being consistent and using a template is eventually the student will become so familiar with what you do that your teacher talk time can be reduced because when a student sees your materials or sees materials that are professional they know what to do they know that the instruction appears at the top followed by a little piece of information and then here you have some questions the student can almost lead themselves and when sorry lead him or herself and when the student's doing that, you're guiding the student. And obviously that's the job of what a good teacher should be doing is just guiding, allowing the student talk time to be as high as possible. Um, it takes time to create content. I would advise you finally, if you can have somebody other than yourself, check it. It's really important to have another set of eyes or to test it with a student before you share it. And that's about it. I think I'll leave it at that. Um...